Thank you, Hannah. That was beautiful. That's my horse growl. Stand together, turn in the Word of God through the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 4. And that be the uh, sermon title, look, if you would please, for a moment. How many of you know what that little orange check in the bottom of the screen is? I heard it what? Is anybody else using a check? <laughs> Exclusive. That is the Nike check mark. That's the mark, distinctive mark. Right? How many of you know what the one above it is? Under Armour. Under Armour. Nobody else. Nike doesn't use Under Armour sign, do they? Under Armour doesn't use Nike sign, right? And uh, how many would guess what that man on the right holding the Bible is the mark of? Lord. A Christian. A Christian. My sermon is the mark. Now there's lots of marks and I'm not preaching about just any mark. Specific marks. The mark from the Word of God. And we're starting with Genesis chapter 4, and let's read together. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Stop for a moment to say, pretty brazen to lie right to the face of God. Yeah. And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out of out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, Whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain. And any finding that any should find him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. How sad. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and thank you for the scripture. Thank you for speaking to my heart. And I pray, dear Father, that you would help us as we preach what you've laid upon my heart. Give us clarity of thought and open minds. Challenge us with your word, Lord. Instruct us. Draw us close. And if there's any present that's not saved. I pray, Lord, that this will be the very hour they would just look to you and place their faith in Jesus Christ. Bless your word to our hearts right now. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to introduce these different scriptures about the mark. 
uh, by saying the mark of sin. Sin brings scars. The marks and scars of sin is awesome. As my mind reflected and God laid this upon my heart and I began to think back, I began to think about so many lives that I've watched sin destroy. I, I watched sin uh, take down the mighty. Sin has taken down the strongest men. Sin has taken down the wealthiest. The smallest to the greatest. Sin has taken down kings and made them paupers. I think of the great wealth of Jeffrey, Epstein, and everything that the world could ever want with all the perversion in his life ended up dying in a prison cell. Wasted lives. I, I thought over the years of my ministry, the people that I've worshipped with and preached to and fellowship with, I, I saw sin take its toll. The marks. The scars. I saw it take the life of a great preacher that ended up committing suicide and shooting himself in a graveyard. Sin has consequences. Awful consequences. And I begin to think about how blessed I am that all my family saved in serving God. And I begin to think way back. And I remember when I was a just, uh, I don't think I was at this particular time that I was even a teenager. I was probably about 12 or 13 years old. But maybe I hadn't even turned to a teenager at that time. But I, I had a whole bunch of cousins in West Virginia. But I had one that I thought was very, very special. My cousin Ruth Ellen. She was the most beautiful. I thought she, if anyone that was ever in love with a cousin, it had been me. <laughs> I thought she was the most beautiful, beautiful person. I didn't think there was anything on earth any worthier than Ruth Ellen. I mean, she had she had skin like it came off a Cosmopolitan magazine. She was uh, a little older. She, she had that, that look. You know, not, not, no, not no teenager, although she was. She was a beautiful, a beautiful cousin. And uh, somehow our lives all got separated and our family moved about, about every four months at that time. And I lost track of her for a long, long time. But I heard down the line that as she grew up, her life went a wayward way. She got in drug, involved in drugs and prostitution and all kind of awful things. And what an awful, awful report to come back to your heart of someone that you had such high esteem and love for. And I remember many, many years later, I had an opportunity and I saw Ruth Ellen for the first time in many years after all of her struggles and with drugs and alcohol and prostitution and, and, and prison time and all of that. And uh, as I saw her, I would not even recognize her. Her face was all pitted with, with the scars of sin. Right. I knew what she had gone through. But sin leaves awful marks. It takes a beautiful person and at the end of it, it turns the countenance bad. The physical with that. So just uh, in my years of, late years in evangelism ministry, I had an opportunity to go down to Brother Roger Green's and had a great mission conference. And I got word that my, that my cousin Ruth Ellen had lived just uh, a little ways from Middletown, Ohio. And I got, I got the privilege, Judy, not to drive by 
She got her life back right with the Lord, but the marks of sin was there. She was pushing these medicines and she'd come down with cancer and uh, she thought she had it all whipped, but she died relatively young from the scars and the marks of sin. And that's only one example. But I wanted to tell you that the devil has a branding iron out there. And if you think that sin won't leave its mark, it will leave its mark hard and it will leave its mark very, very deep. You know, as, you, as we look at our lives, and I showed you these illustrations, because everything has its own specific mark. All right? The Christian has a mark. We're marked by our life. When your life turns to Jesus and the glorious light of God gets in you, your light shining out to the, to the, to the world. It, it, because we're that peculiar person, if we're the right kind of a Christian, your life is marked. And we ought to have the mark. We ought to let people see our, us carrying our Bible. Our, our life of being honest. Our life as a Christian. There's so many people out there that claim to be Christians. And the unsaved world, as I've witnessed to so many, uh, thousands and thousands of unsaved people over my lifetime, I have heard, I cannot tell you numerous countless times how disappointed unsaved people are at the what they see in the life of believers that claim to know God and to be God's disgracing the marks of sin. So we need to we need to understand that, that our our mark ought to be Christian. To be a Christian is to say I'm like Christ. That should be in our word, in our conversations, in our walk, in our talk. It ought to be God honoring because there's a mark. Now today people want to mark themselves up. I'll start with, uh, I watched the boxing match the other day and uh, I couldn't tell what, what color skin this guy had because it was solid tattoo. <laughs> you think, isn't that crazy? Marking, if God wanted you to have an eagle on you, he would put one on you and use one. <laughs> Amen? Right. A, 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 you know what a tattoo is? It's a, it's a permanent reminder of a temporary insanity. <laughs> <laughs> What are people thinking? <laughs> and I begin to think about Christians, how, how, how we look. I'm going to eat this thing, I think, before it's over. <laughs> <laughs> if I do, somebody save me. <laughs> if you as a Christian were brought before the courts of the land or before ISIS or before magistrates to to prove or to or, or to be convicted of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Think about that. Is there enough evidence to convict you? It seems like some Christians want to blend into the world. God says no. You come out from among them and be sacred so you can have the mark of a believer upon your life. The mark of a believer. Not a mark, the mark of a believer. This is one right here. If you love the Lord, you're going to live for Him. We are marked as Christians. I see here the mark of God upon Cain. 
Can people tell you're a Christian by the outward appearance? It's important. It's not the most important thing. But man looks on the outward appearance. If you're going to have any influence with mankind, you can't look like the world and have influence with the world. The world knows what a Christian is supposed to look like. They've heard enough preaching from the old time ways right on up that they know right from wrong and they, they expect something out of you as a Christian. Right. If you're a Christian and you owe them a debt, they expect you to pay it. They expect you to be honest. They don't expect to find you in the local bars and the taverns. Right. Huh. They have expectations of Christians. And preachers all over the country preaching that we are the hope of the unsaved people to get the word of God to their hearts and life. And they're looking at Christians galore passing them by every single day and nobody witnessing to them. I happened to get, do a self-analysis one day and I thought, in my whole lifetime, from a child right on up through, I was... Raised in raised uh, in a Christian home, and nobody ever would have any suspicion that I wasn't a Christian because I was I was marked as a Christian. I was raised in uh, in a God fearing home. Never got involved in drugs or alcohol or or cigarettes or all those things. I can say I never missed a thing. I never missed one thing. But I began to think, in all my years, right up at the time that the Lord revealed I was thinking about this thought, not one person has ever walked up to me and said, if you were to die, Ronnie, would you be in heaven or would you be in hell? Not one single witness ever came to this soul and ask me right. if I go to heaven. I've been in churches and I heard it enough to know. But what about all the people that don't get in churches enough to hear? Right. And all they're depending upon is somebody that knows the Lord to come out and tell them. And I thought, you know what? If God had to take care of me through my family and through these preachers and through churches and that through the me to reach me the way God reached me, I would still be lost on my way to hell. Yeah. Because not one single Christian ever came to me and asked me, Are you a believer? Right. And after I preached this, it was on my heart, someone came up to me and said, Are you saved? <laughs> you know you go to heaven? And he did that just so I couldn't say nobody had asked me. <laughs> By the way, since he asked me sarcastically that question, I still haven't had nobody come up to me and say, if you die, are you all right? See? Wouldn't you think that automatically, somewhere, some way, some Christian would at least approach Approach everyone. Yeah, you can even look like a Christian or maybe be known as a Christian. Oh, well, everybody's all right. I've got an announcement to make. Everybody's not all right. Amen. Right. Right. There's a mark of sin. Yeah. A mark of an unsaved. <clears throat> if they die, they were lost and split hell wide open. Right. Somebody has to Speak up. Well, Cain and Abel, you know the story. I don't have to spend a lot of time. But Cain lied right to the face of God. I don't know where my brother is. Your blood's crying from the ground. And God then brought it right down to him that you're, you're going to be a vagabond. You're going to be driven out of 
the earth and that earth that swallowed up your brother's blood in your hand is not ever going to be a blessing to you. And he's the one that offered the cursed ground to begin with right. as a sacrifice straight to God. So the Lord set a mark upon Cain because he said, oh, with all of this, everybody that sees me is going to want to kill me. And God said, I'm going to put a mark upon you that anybody that looks you, and, and that anybody that kills Cain, sevenfold vengeance will be upon them if they kill you because your worst <laughs> punishment until you go down to the lake of fire and down to hell is living with what you did. Yeah. Guilty conscience. Well, that's one perspective. I want us to go over to over to Philippians, the book of Philippians, <coughs> chapter three. Let's look at what the Apostle Paul said. The Apostle Paul said, Brethren, as a Christian apostle writing to the brothers and sisters in Christ, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Do you know who the Apostle Paul was before he got saved? A Christian murderer. Right. His life completely turned about. Completely turned about. And now he's defending and writing with someone like the Apostle Paul that God saved him that did such an about face wrote three quarters of the New Testament of the book of God. Amen. You know what I have to say? If I'm going to have to set my eyes on the mark. I've got to set my eyes on the goal. And let me tell you, how many Christians down here just live, go through life living and never set a goal for God? Never set a mark. You've got to set your eyes upon the goal. Right. Set your eyes upon the finish line. The goal line. To cross a goal line, you've got to have a mark. You've got to have a goal. I want to suggest a goal. If there's anyone in this room that's never personally led a person to Jesus Christ, that will be a good goal to set your eye upon to win your first soul personally, individually, and privately to Jesus Christ. Yeah. Crossing that finish line. The lines are doing pretty good. That's the football team. But a few years back, they were afraid to go over the goal line because they thought that white powder line was anthrax. <laughs> <laughs> you want to win a game, you got you to gotta get in the end zone. Paul said, in order for me to look to the things that's ahead, can I tell you, time is running out. Right. It's time we set some goals. Oh, you know, New Year's resolutions, it'll be coming soon, but those were just made to be broken. They turned to be a joke. You, 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 you should not make no covenants. Right. We're not capable of keeping <laughs> covenants. Right. But we ought to strive to be better. We ought to strive to see and to inventory our life at the end of the year and look at what we've done and what we've accomplished and where we stand with God and say, I, I know the time is closing in. I don't have much more time. And set some goals. And set our hearts. And set our affections. And set 
had our love to accomplish some things for Jesus. And if I'm going to do that, I've got to forget the things that are behind me because, oh, the devil, if that's what's hurt you in the past, I've watched through the years of my ministry people that's dropped out on God right. and out of church and away from God for years. And finally, sometimes they make it back. And sometimes when they do make it back, they're so fragile and, and feeble and the marks of sin so hard upon them and the scars of sin. They have no, not even any hope of doing what they could do or be what they could have been had they only just stayed on the course. Because if you sin, you've got an advocate with the Father. The blood of Jesus Christ has covered that sin, and you're kept by that blood and by that power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So just say, hey, 1 John 1, 9, I'm going to confess my sin, I'm going to accept forgiveness, I'm going to turn from it, I'm not going to waste my time or God's. <coughs> I'm going to stay true. And when you fail, don't beat yourself up. And let me give you another piece of advice. When God forgives you, please don't forget ever to forgive yourself. Amen. Because you'll beat yourself up. Right. Yep. You'll hold back waiting on God to knock your block off because you knew you deserved it. That's what sin does. It takes your confidence away. It depletes you. It stagnates you. You've got to get it under the blood and forget everything in the past. Well, listen, we can't do anything about our past. Yeah. Neither should we try. Because when you meet Jesus, I've got an announcer to make your past is all dead and gone. And it's buried in the sea of God's forgiveness. You got a brand new life, brand new eyes, brand new hands, brand new feet, brand new opportunity. Yeah. Already, the blood that saved you is the blood that's going to forgive you out there in the future when you stumble or you falter or you make a mistake. Oh, he's a loving God. He's not a big God that stands up in heaven with a hammer that wants to mash you down when you sin. Oh, sin is what broke the heart of God. Sin is what broke the body of Jesus Christ on the cross. Right. Yep. God's a loving God, a forgiving God, a powerful God. Paul said, press toward the mark. I gotta hurry. I gotta show you another mark. <laughs> Go with me if you would please to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 13. I'm just basically gonna try to in a hurried fashion give you this. But in Revelation chapter 13 is where you see the devil's trinity coming up. You remember he said, I will be like the most high. So God has a trinity. God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit of God. And the devil's not his trinity. He's got the devil but compares himself to God. And he's got the Antichrist with his, whose deadly wound was healed comparing himself to Jesus with the scars in his body. And, the, and that false prophet that comes out to cause the whole world to worship the beast, the Antichrist. He's the one that compares himself to the Holy Spirit of God. Because the Holy Spirit of God causes the whole world to be drawn to Jesus. Not to himself, but to Jesus Christ. And that false prophet is to cause the whole world by the control system to worship the beast. In Revelation chapter 13, we see the coming forward. And I stood upon the sands of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his ten horns crowns, and upon, upon his head the name of blasphemy. 
And the beast which I saw was like unto a man, and his feet was the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, and, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his authority. Who's the dragon? Look in Revelation 12, it's the devil. The devil gave the Antichrist his power, his authority, and his seat. Jesus, God gave Jesus Christ his power, his authority, and his seat. And here he is. And the great authority. In verse 3, I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, whose death which uh, his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered at the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great, uh, uh, great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. If he's continuing forty and two months... That's three and one half years. Right. That means the raptures were all to be gone. The Antichrist is going to be revealed. He's already been there with his great seat and power and authority for three and one half years. And he's going to continue for another three and one half years, which is seven year period of time, that tribulation period down on earth by the saints of God there in heaven. I'm going to show you something beautiful in just a few moments. But here is the Antichrist. And then if we look on over later in that, in that uh, portion of Scripture for, for the Antichrist. Let's look at verse 14. It talks about them that deceive those on earth by the uh, by the means of the miracles which he does with his power and his power is to reign down here and deceive the people in verse 16 and he this is the false prophet the false prophet is it comes forth in verse 11 I beheld another beast which is the false prophet coming up out of the earth and it describes him and he comes as a lamb. How did Jesus Christ come? As the lamb of God. And down in verse 16. And he causeth all, now get this, that's all that's left on earth when the Antichrist comes over, the Spirit of God will be gone, all the Christians will be gone, and now a great tribulation period, and right in the middle is when those 21 judgments come down from God out of heaven in that tribulation period. Right. But until that time, during that seven years on earth, it says, he in verse 16, he causeth all, both great, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, that's pretty much everybody, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And that no man might buy or sell save that he have the mark. Right. That's the mark of the beast. Or the name of the beast. Or the number of his name. Look at this. Here's wisdom. Let him that understandeth count the number of the beast. For it is the number of man, which is six. And his number is six hundred, three score, and six. The mark of the beast is six, six, six. Right. right. He's got a number. No man that doesn't have the mark can buy or sell. That means no buying groceries, no selling nothing to survive. It'll be hard times. That's the way he's going to be controlling the world. 
by the way, by Sharia law, no doubt. Because to fail is to have behead, is to be beheaded. He's going to control the world. And right now, there's a, in, Br in Brussels, Belgium, there's a, there's a huge building with all, which is the computer center of information of all the world. And the whole world flows their information every kind of information, the, the financial information, all the information flows in this building. It's all set up. And you know what the building is called? The Beast. The Beast will control the world from the revised Roman Empire. And the false prophet control the religious world, the one world church from Jerusalem. And guess what? Jesus is going to start breaking up the party in the middle of the tribulation period. Yeah. Amen. When the 21 judgments begin to fall. <clears throat> Let me show you something exciting. I just let's just go to chapter 20 for a moment and verse 10 and let me show you. First of all, let's go to let's go to chapter 19. Chapter 19. Verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, these both, that's the beast and the false prophet, these both were cast alive into a lake burning with fire and brimstone. I'll show you. In verse 20 of chapter 10, chapter 20, it says the devil but deceived them right. was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are. That's the end of the devil's trinity right there. Yeah. I read the book. Amen. I see the end of the story right there. But just prior to him coming and taking the beast and the false prophet, and then it talks about that battle of Armageddon where the, the blood is up to the horses' bridles, and he sends this great flock of, of birds to feed upon their flesh in verse 21. God's going to come back and he's going to... But I want to show you that prior to this, just look back in chapter 19, verse 11, and let me show you... Let me show you the victory. The victory for the Christian. What's going to happen? At the end of that seven year tribulation, after all the judgments come, he is coming back to rule and reign upon this earth a thousand years with all the saints of God. Jesus Christ left this world with the crown of thorns and he's coming back with the victor's crown. Look at chapter 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. Right. That's none other than Jesus Christ. Amen. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father full of truth. Dipped in blood with the victor's crown upon his head, and his name is called the Word of God in verse 14. And the iron armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. 
and out of his mouth proceeded the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he should rule them with the rod of iron. And he treaded the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God Almighty. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. And I saw that angel standing on the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls of the air, gather to eat the bodies of the bond and the free and the poor and the rich and the paupers and the kings. He's coming back to make war. He's coming back. You, I, I, I just always worried about that, me coming back on that white horse. I've had nightmare experiences with horses. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> The Lord's going to save us. Amen? <laughs> and although I'd be afraid of heights, I don't want to fail to go up. Right. Thank God we're going to be changed. Amen? Amen? We're coming back to rule and reign with the Lord for a thousand years, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I have not time to turn there, but Revelation 7, uh, 2 and 3 talks about that 144,000 witnesses that's going to come from the Jews, and they're going to be preaching the word, the, uh, preaching uh, the message to, to turn to God, turn to God, turn to God. But before they went out, God put a mark Right. in their forehead right. before his servants were to go out mm -hmm. to spread the good news. Right. One more mark and I'm finished. Go with me to the Gospel of John chapter 20 verse 24 to the disciples and this is where we find this. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus was not with him when Jesus came. The other disciples uh, therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, again the disciples were with him, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the door being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. And then he said, He saith unto Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and hold my hands, and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet believed. Amen. I've never seen the stars. Right. I've never had the chance yet. But one day I will. Right. This thought came to my mind, and I think I mentioned it Wednesday. I, I taught in here. There's five crowns Christians can earn. Those are the only thing that really will ever belong to you that you can give back to Jesus Christ. Everything you have and ever did have and ever will have came from Him. But as you serve Him down here and your works go up, you earn those crowns. And one day, He said, Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. The crowns to give to every man according to His work. And if you've worked and if you've got those crowns there that Jesus one day is going to give you your crowns, the crown of faithfulness, the crown of rejoicing, the soul winner's crown, the crown for loving his appearing, those five crowns that you can work and labor and serve him with your life, and he's going to give those. Those you have earned, they are yours, lock, stock, and barrel. 
you deserve them. They're prized possession. And one day when we kneel at his nail scarred feet, he will have something to lay at his feet. That's yours. Right. Can you think how much he's given you? You could really serve God and set your eyes like Paul on that goal to reach those crowns to lay them one day at the feet of Jesus. <clears throat> your crowns he gave you. And I was thinking what a privilege it would be if while I knelt in his presence and I put my crowns in his feet, if I could just kiss the nail scar. The only thing made in heaven by the hands of man that will be there forever the scars yeah. in the body of the Savior oh, while our glorified bodies will be perfect. The marks, the mark is on Jesus forever. And just remember, for that sea and multitudes of people in the new Jerusalem and the new heaven and the new earth forever and ever that will be worshiping and serving Him. All of those, those signs and those marks on His hands and feet will still be there. And you'll say, these are forever yours. Well, I love to get these little cards that said, forever yours. Have you ever gotten one of those? Just as a closing, someone write forever yours. Forever. Love forever. That's what Jesus provided for us. Love forever. And He loves us here. So that we love Him here. Stand up for Jesus. And be the mark. Be his mark. Amen? Amen. And every way you can let him shine. Let's stand.